Well, thank you. I think we've had a, a terrific first panel, and I uh, hope we'll uh, be able to match that in the second panel. We certainly have a good, uh, good group of folks to discuss some of these issues. Um, so we have three people who are speaking on the panel. The first is Paul Kupiak, who is the resident, senior, resident scholar at AEI, was previously associate director at FDIC, where we, he oversaw research on bank risk measurement and regulatory pol policies such as Basel III. He's also worked at the IMF, at JP Morgan, and at the Federal Reserve, and has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. So welcome. Uh, our second panelist is Marcus Stanley, who's the policy, policy director of Americans for Financial Reform and has uh, been a frequent contributor to panels here. So we're very grateful uh, to you, Marcus, for, uh, for coming again and uh, speaking with us. Uh, he has a PhD in public policy from Harvard and has been the economic and political advisor to Senator Barbara Boxer. Our third panel member doesn't probably need any introduction. After all, he was uh, moderating the first panel, and that's Doug Elliott, who is a fellow here at uh, the Brookings Institution, has written a lot on uh, financial regulation. He was a former investment banker at uh, J.P. Morgan and a founder of uh, Coffee, his own uh, think tank in an earlier incarnation. Uh, so welcome to all three of you and to everyone here. We're going to start with Paul. You're going to make remarks. Um, I don't know if he needs help pulling up the, the presentation, or do you have slides to come up? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I got the topic of this sec se session, it's called, what should we do, uh, you know, what should we do? And my first question is sort of three questions. What should we do about what, all right? What should we do about the OFR study? What should we do about the asset management industry? Or maybe what should we do about the FSOC SIFI designation process? So first, uh, I'm going to move uh, and talk a little bit about, about the OFR study. And... Uh, the OFR study came out in September, and um, it was sort of this very unusual process whereby the Securities Exchange Commission uh, asked for comments on an OFR report in, in 60 days, uh, actually 30 days maybe, and a number of people commented on the report, and, and by and large the, the report did not get sort of a very favorable rating. It's sort of been widely criticized as viewing asset managers as if they were banks, uh, it has been criticized that there's no uh, actual original research in the report. The report itself is sort of a, 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 a very nuanced interpretation of the existing literature. The, one of the particular things that, that people found problematic was while the report was you know, asked for by the FSOC committee, it doesn't really produce a framework for assessing whether an, a, an individual asset manager poses systemic risk. There's no framework in the paper, as, as I think you heard uh, Director Berner say earlier they focused on activities that, that are done industry-wide and, and by banks and, 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 and management firms. And so, so it's not clear how this fits into the actual helping the SIFI designation process. Uh, the report uh, sort of focuses on things like herding and stretch for yield, which applies to all investors. It's not a, a particular problem just for, uh, or if, even if it is a problem. Um, I'm going to come back to that in, in a minute. It also focuses on, mentions things like fees and conflicts of interest, which really are, are not the case for, for regular mutual funds that we think about where fees are regulated, performance fees are regulated. It's more about hedge funds and maybe private equity and funds that are specifically set aside for sophisticated investors who are supposed to understand how fees work to incent, incent people. And um, it, it talks about redemption risk, even though it's not talking about money market mutual funds. Uh, it, or it claims. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the redemption risk arguments in a second. Uh, it mentions a lot of issues with uh, exchange-traded funds, although this is a relatively small class of, of funds compared to the whole entire industry, some of which do have leverage. Uh, it sort of deals with it as if the whole, the whole thing is a systemic problem. It brings up issues with securities lending where lots of financial institutions do securities lending. And again, this should be maybe a focus on the rules of conduct and, and not a, in a SIFI designation report. So um, if I were to have to summarize it sort of in, in, in one, I like to 
get a little few pictures in every now and then or a cartoon. Ed Kane sort of taught me that. I was thinking, how would I summarize this? And in, in one of my uh, favorite movies, Men in Black 2, I just remember the scene when Kay is put back in the post office and somebody brings in this horribly wrapped package and he says, this is a case of go home and do it again, Mrs. Whoever it was. And I just, I just thought that that was maybe, maybe the reaction to, to the report, at least for me. So, I hope. So what should we do about the asset management industry? So um, here's my little, uh, my little that's, that's the asset management industry. There's Michael Douglas with his big cigar. That's what guys do in asset management, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, the asset management industry, what about concentration in the industry? You know, is, why is it a problem? Well, first of all, asset managers are not banks. They've said that a bunch of times, uh, people have today. Asset management firms themselves have very little leverage. The assets are owned by the fund participants. And, and outside of money market mutual funds, there's no guaranteed redemption value. The, the shareholders in these funds expect to gain in the profit and loss. And if we actually go to concentration in the industry, I'm, I'm borrowing some slides from the Investment Company Institute, so thank you in advance for allowing me to use those, even though you didn't know I was going to do this. Um, the, the, the concentration in the asset in the, in the asset management industry, it, it's, it's concentrated. The largest 10 uh, complexes have about 53% of the assets, according to ICI in 2012. And, and that's, that's increased since 1995 from about 47%. So the growth in concentration, uh, it's concentrated. The growth isn't all that extreme. And in the bottom panel, you'll see I borrowed a, a, a panel from a, a New York Federal Reserve uh, uh, Bank article on uh, bank holding companies, and you can see the dark line there is the concentration level, and it's on the left scale of the top 10 bank uh, holding company assets under management. And it, start, it starts well below, it says 27% in 1991 and grows to something like 65%, and this ends in 2011, and so maybe it's even grown since then. So the, the growth in concentration in holding company assets in the banking system is sort of much more much more of an issue probably than it has been in, in, in the mutual fund industry. So industry over concentration has increased over time. But one of the interesting things about the mutual fund industry, I'm going to borrow from the ICI's report, is that mutual funds enter and exit the industry all the time. Um, in fact, mutual fund liquidations, liquidations of actual liquidations of funds are not particularly uncommon, right? There's a lot a year, almost... Uh, you know, one, one a business day in many years, and there were two a business day in, in 2009. And it's not a, a very big deal unless a money market mutual fund breaks the buck, which occasionally happens, you know, not, actually not that often. Uh, and, um, but, but there's entry and exit, and, and mutual funds merging or, or you know, liquidating are, are, are sort of not, you know, front page news all the time, which makes me not worry so much about it. Um, this is, you've already seen these two slides. Brian put them up and spent a lot of time on it, but I want to talk a little bit about herding and, and um, this notion that there could be redemption and fire sales. Now, the OFR focus it pulls its information, the OFR report pulls its information from mutual fund, study, mutual fund studies that are already in the literature. And if you go to the references and you look at the studies in the literature, the studies in the literature do say that when mutual funds, the equity mutual funds mainly, experience big outflows, they have to sell assets and asset, and asset prices fall. Not a surprise. What they also say in another part of these same studies is when these mutual funds have big inflows, they have to go out and buy assets and that raises the price of assets. Well, the OFR study I have a particular issue through because it, it focuses only on the negative side of these graphs and it calls those fire sales because that's a very, very uh, cool phrase in banking right now. So, when they sell assets, it causes fire sales. But what about when asset prices go up, when, when, when people buy mutual fund assets? There's obviously price pressure there. Is that a systemic risk? Or, or is it just, it, we just can't have losses, I guess. I don't know. To me, this is supply and demand, though. And, and, and it's really an issue about supply and demand. And the fire sale, the fire sale critique that's put on, on these particular studies is, is, is really not appropriate. So. Uh, another issue that, that we need to think about is that the designating the largest asset management shop as SIFIs would impose costs on investors. Investor cost and fund size are very much linked, and I'm again borrowing from the ICI fact book. Investors reward asset managers that are efficient because they tend to put most of their money in asset managers where the fees are, are small. So if you look at these charts, these are different asset uh, fund categories, and the green 
is for the percentage of funds that have uh, fees in the lowest 25th percentile. So the cheapest funds uh, have the most assets under management, 72%, 69%, 80%, whereas the most expensive funds don't have many assets under management. So investors seem to be pretty rational this way, and they, they reward funds that, that, that you know, are, are cheap, right? That, that, that do what they want them to do in, ex, in an inexpensive, efficient manner. I would remark that this is unlike large bank holding companies, where the evidence is that depositors pay higher fees and get lower interest rates in the too-big-to-fail banks. So anyway, I think investment companies have something going for them here, and investors pick it out. So what about the F FSOC designation process? Um, and if, we ha if I had to think about that, that's my slide there, and that's, a, that's an old clip from the son of Frankenstein. And, and it, if you look in the clip of this thing, there's actually an existential debate that goes on behind the scenes here, and it's, it's really highbrow, and it, and it says, was, you know, was Frankenstein born evil, or did somehow his environment you know, make him evil? So if you think about Dodd-Frank and the and the, and the designation process. You can think of whatever you want about that. But anyway, I have some words, actually. I didn't want to go to thank you yet. So the SIFI designation process, in my view, is a mess, right? There's a little science involved and a whole lot of politics. De and designation leads to what when it's a non-bank SIFI? Uh, bank capital and liquidity rules? How does this make any sense? These are not banks, most of them. How will this reduce financial sector risk? This is what we were looking for in the FSOC report, the OFR report for the OFR was, should have been producing for the FSOC, and it, and it just wasn't in there. So the politics. So if you look at who they've designated, you have GE Capital and AIG. These are big TARP rescue recipients. They were big users of the FDIC's TLGP program. And so both of these, if you think it uh, politically, were very much a must from the FSOC, uh, uh, you know, SIFI designees. How is the FSOC not going to designate these guys? You look at Prudential. Prudential applied for TARP, and it was approved for TARP money, but it turned TARP money down. As far as I can tell in the FDIC records, it did not use uh, the temporary liquidity guarantee program to issue any debt. And maybe you not, might not be shocked that when Prudential was designated, it was pretty unhappy about it. And it's the only firm that I'm aware of so far that's appealed the ruling. And who do you appeal to? You appeal to the FSOC. And of course, the FSOC said, well, we'll think about it again. And oh, no, you're a SIFI. They lost. They didn't get it. So MetLife also did not take a TARP. MetLife, is, to my understanding, is still under consideration. It did not take TARP, but it did use the FDIC's TLGP to the tune of about $14 billion. So in my view, probably they're toast, but they haven't been decided upon yet. Prudential was detonated and appealed and lost. MetLife still under consideration. So the FSOC, one of the interesting things about the Prudential case is, and you can go out and read it, the FSOC dissenting opinions on Prudential. The three agencies or the three FSOC uh, players that, 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 uh, that, that dissented were the FHFA, the State ins Insurance Commissioner FSOC representative, and the FSOC independent member with in insurance experience. And each of these opinions, if you read them, are very thoughtful, and they raise, they raise a lot of concerns about the basic FSOC case made for the CIFI designation and Prudential. All of these dissenting opinions criticize the FSOC designation process. They say there's a pervasive bi banking bias in the way the FSOC thinks about these things. It treats every investor claim like it's a bank deposit that will run, even when there's no evidence to support this, these assumptions. The, the FSOC ignores, ignored contracts and regulatory features that prevent runs in insurance products. Uh, it even, the FSOC report even criticized the fact that in state insurance companies are ring-fenced by state regulation to prevent contagion, so you can kind of control risk in the funds. And it said this could inhibit a, a resolution process, so it's kind of strange. And, 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 and the, the independent insurance members took issue with this, what, you know, something that's worked so well for so long. Why is this, why is this a risk? Why is this a problem? Uh, none of the FSOC members that wrote these, uh, these, these dissenting opinions found the case compelling, uh, and, and one of them uh, presciently asked, well, what exactly does the prudential designation fix? There's no indication in, 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 the, in, the, in the FSOC ruling what prudential could do to de right? It doesn't really say why prudential's a SIFI or what features make it SIFI. It's just big and it could be a problem, and there's no specifics that would allow prudential sort of to get out of this designation. And, and, that, and that's, that's the descending uh, issue. So what does it look like for asset managers? If you look at the existing uh, decisions so far, I would say the pi picture's not very pretty. Um, I think the FSOC seems inclined to take asset size alone as a pretty compelling factor. 
Uh, and one of the interesting things is, if, if you think about what Dick was talking about and some of the things brought up about hedge funds and leverage and ETFs, the largest uh, asset management complexes are not the guys doing this mainly, right? It's, this is not really a debate unless it's changed a lot about designating hedge funds. It's really a debate about designating the biggest players, it, it seems to me, unless something's changed. So I expect that the, the, the reports on the FSOC as, asset manager will, will assume that their assets run uh, just, like a, just like a bank deposit. It will treat it as a fire sale externality uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. And one of the telling features is, and, and the OFR report mentions it, is the money market mutual funds of the bank Holding companies are already subject to stress testing under the Federal Reserve stress testing account because they're in a holding company and, you know, maybe the, the, the feeling on the FSOC is maybe we should get them all under it. I don't, I don't know. I'm not privy to that. But again, what, what, what framework is in place to reduce the risk? Bank holding company rules? Why do these make sense for these kind of firms? Why does more capital in the management firm or anything? Are shareholders going to expect them to bail out funds when they break the buck and other things? This just doesn't, the framework is not in place and the issues have not been clearly identified. So I will now say thank you and see you at questions. Let me, uh, oh, here we go. So which is the, just the, yeah, okay. Um, so, so I thought there was a, a rather surprising amount of uh, agreement underneath the, the disagreement in the first panel, and I think there's going to be a certain amount of uh, surprising agreement in, in this panel as well. Um, specifically, uh, although I think our emphasis is going to be very different, my emphasis is going to be on the first part of this, that there shouldn't be any question about the systemic risk posed by the set of activities that we put under the label of asset management. And it's very important to address those systemic risks. But I also think there really is a very open question about how best to regulate it. And that, that question circulates around the question of what, what are we doing with designation, which is what, what Paul raised here. Uh, what is designation for and what does designation imply? Now, I think FSOC was kind of caught in the middle on that because really, and, and the, the, the third point there is I think what we're looking at in this whole situation is some really disturbing and troubling problems with the fragmentation of our regulatory system. Because really that, that question about what designation is for and what it implies, uh, you really need the participation of the Federal Reserve to answer that. They're the people who are going to write the rules for designated entities. So. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're really seeing um, the regulators approaching a really critical question, how to regulate the systemic risks involved with asset management, um, but we're, we're seeing a, a very sort of disturbing process uh, that seems to be highlighted by, by turf wars and public squabbles between uh, the regulators, where in, instead it requires very tight cooperation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to suggest that's because of the, the fragmentation of our regulatory system, which is really constructed for a Glass-Steagall world of functional divisions that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, now, some, some of what I'm going to say uh, in, in uh, here, I, I sort of uh, figured that this would happen, um, was covered in a lot of detail in the first panel, which I thought was, was very good. Um, but the, the, the argument on asset managers is always that asset managers just deploy other people's money. You know, what's, what's the problem? Well, most of what goes on in financial systems is in some sense or other deploying other people's money. And there, there are lots of problems that can occur. Um, the, we've heard a lot of talk about pro-cyclical hot money and, and how this can create bubbles. Well, uh, it's, it's been raised, isn't this just financial markets? Isn't this what people do? They pursue yields in financial markets. Well, guess what? Asset bubbles are something that are inherently a part of financial markets, too. You can do an experimental uh, asset financial market in a classroom with full information on the underlying value of an asset. You'll still get a bubble. 
And guess what? Bubbles are a macroeconomic problem. I mean, how many speeches and how much discussion do we have to see from the Federal Reserve about how to address asset inflation, how to address asset bubbles? Is the only way to do it through the blunt tool of interest rates, or can we use financial regulation to do it? Well, th this is what we're talking about here. How can we use financial regulation to, uh, to potentially address asset bubbles? And also, the, the second and third thing here should really kind of just be slid together under liquidity and maturity transformation. Obviously, I don't mean just promises of short-term liquidity. You can redeem any time from a fund, uh, but the promise of short-term stable value and then the use of funds given, the, the use of money given to a fund under a promise of some kind of short-term stable value or at least low volatility and the use of that money to invest in longer-term assets or longer-term credit. And that's uh, liquidity and maturity transformation. And reach, the, the reach for yield is particularly a problem in this context, I think, because there's a have your cake and eat it too element of what people selling products in the financial markets try to do. They try to say, hey, this is really safe. It's going to have a stable, val reasonably stable value over the short term. But on the other hand, it's got a, a bigger return for you than anything else that's safe, right? Um, that's, as I said, that's having your cake and eating it too. And not surprisingly, that's the kind of promise that blows up in people's faces. And that's the kind of promise that you can see from asset managers. Uh, use of implicit and explicit leverage and a potentially expanded role post Dodd-Frank that hasn't gotten much attention yet that I want to talk about. But the thing we hear when these things are raised is these don't count. You know, uh, it's, it's don't regulate me, regulate the guy behind the tree. Um, th this is somehow outside of the space that we're supposed to be talking about with asset managers. In the case of liquidity and maturity transformation, oh, well, that, that's money market funds, and that's happening in that rule over there. Well, asset managers are the sponsors of money market funds, and money market funds have kept their stable value over the decades by hundreds and hundreds of sponsor interventions over the years. This has been well documented. Where are these sponsor interventions coming from? Well, they're coming from asset managers. That's actually, in, in most cases, not all, but in many cases. And that's actually one of the cases where asset managers do look a little like banks. Um, so, you know, and say we did do a good regulation of money market funds that, that addressed the issues in money market funds, implicitly making it harder for the managers of, of money market funds to make that have your cake and eat it too promise to people that I'm going to give you a high return for, uh, you know, a short-term stable value. Well, we could expect to see other kinds of funds making that same kind of promise. Um, and we're already seeing those kinds of funds, short-term liquidity funds that aren't necessarily money market funds. Um, and likewise, uh, in terms of the use of leverage, we had this compelling and powerful, Brian gave this compelling and powerful and eloquent defense of the 40 Act in the first, uh, in the first presentation. And I love that because the, the 40 Act is significantly tougher than Dodd-Frank. If, uh, if we could uh, go out there and put the protections of the 40 Act out there for everybody in the financial markets, that would be awesome. Uh, and AFR, I think, would support a lot of that. But of course, there are many, many entities out there that are, uh, are run by asset managers that are forms of funds that, that take advantage of various exemptions from the 40 Act. Um, so when, when you focus on the 40 Act, you're, you're not getting the whole universe of funds. Um, and in terms of run risk, you know, this is, uh, th this, is money mar this is the run on money market funds that occurred during the crisis. You see in a, in a period of one month, 25% uh, of, uh, of prime funds run. They mostly run to government funds. You lose $500 billion. This is why the United States government had to get behind and uh, bail out the entire sector. You know, that's a run leading to a government bailout. It doesn't get uh, much clearer than that. Um, and this is what happened to, in the uh, securities lending markets. Well, not just the securities lending market, but the, the overnight repo and the commercial paper market. Um, that financial commercial paper, when, when people were running from the prime funds, uh, the prime funds were the customers for that commercial paper. That commercial paper was the mechanism that let them fund these longer-term assets that created the maturity uh, and liquidity transformation I was talking about. And you see a complete collapse. You see a collapse of over 50 percent 
in both of these markets, uh, securities lending and the uh, commercial paper markets. And that's really, you see M2, the normal money supply, doesn't do very much, but the supply of financial sector generated money just collapses catastrophically. And um, the asset manager uh, industry, as a major sort of customer in the repo markets and as a major purchaser of financial uh, commercial paper, had something to do with that. And I, I think looking back at the financial crisis, looking back at 2008, the securities lending market is really the mechanism through which a lot of this happens. Um, when, when you look at the systemic impact and implications of fund behavior in, um, in 2008, some of it, I think, did occur through uh, the exit of, um, through sort of herding behavior, but really the securities lending market is the epicenter, and funds were incredibly important uh, participants in that in all kinds of ways. But now, now we look at, at po what's going to happen in, uh, in post-Dodd-Frank. Um, you can, you know, if you just look around, you can see numerous observers of the market saying that uh, funds, it's mostly hedge funds, but that funds are going to get more involved in the direct lending sector. Um, that as we see things like the Volcker Rule and capital provisions uh, changing the equation for the, uh, for the big banks on uh, liquidity provision in the corporate bond market on things like uh, prime brokerage, uh, you could easily see asset managers stepping in. You know, Fidelity is already the 10th largest prime broker in the financial system. I think that one, um, this relates to something Rick Delphin said in, in uh, his question regarding um, uh, electronic trading. I think one of the, the uh, directions in Dodd-Frank, both through the Volcker rule and through the standardization of derivatives, is more movement to trading of standardized instruments in electronic markets. Well, depending on how an electronic market is, uh, is designed, you can get a very wide range of liquidity providers. Basically, the person with the biggest securities inventory is going to end up being one of the most significant, um, potentially has the power to end up being one of the most significant liquidity providers, especially in all-to-all -all markets where anyone can interact with anyone else on an anonymous basis. You can very easily slide into being a market maker, and that may already be happening. Uh, I think one, one thing I didn't put up here that I think is, is quite important is the Jobs Act and general solicitation for hedge funds. Um, you, you know, you're going to be able to, to do, we, don't, we haven't really seen exactly the protections that are going to be on this, but potentially, you know, you're going to be able to call up grandma's nursing home and advertise a, a purchase of a hedge fund to her. Uh, that's going to create some really interesting uh, bubble dynamics. And then we just have all the interconnections with the banks. I mean, you can see it's just visible that about half of the top U.S. asset managers are owned by global SIFIs. And then there are all kinds of other connections, I think, going on behind the scenes. This is not a hard-to-see connection. It's just one I was ignorant of. But how many people knew that PNC Bank owns a fifth of BlackRock? You know, I actually didn't know that. It was probably my ignorance. But uh, I think there are a lot of connections buried away in there. And I think that the, the OFR report, you know, which has come in for so much... Uh, uh, abuse, I think mo mostly a sort of a preemptive strike on designation, was simply, in my perspective, raising these issues for uh, a discussion, and a discussion that's, that's long overdue. Um, but I think that the reaction to this report has really been disturbing. We've seen kind of a turf protection and a turf war uh, reaction in which the industry has been enlisted kind of by one regulatory agency to criticize another regulatory agency. And it's, it's, to me, that's a very disturbing uh, thing to be seeing when what we need is uh, cooperation by the regulatory agencies. And as I said at the beginning here, uh, the U.S., unlike Britain and some other countries, is living in sort of a Glass-Steagall regulatory system that assumes functional divisions uh, so that our regulatory system actually sort of uh, is, is built around this assumption that only certain kinds of entities can do certain kinds of activities. Whereas the reality now is that these activities are spreading across all kinds of, of entities, and if you regulate one entity in one way, the activity can very easily migrate. And in terms of the, the, the purpose of the FSOC was to make our regulatory system, I think, flexible and cooperative enough to handle this situation, and so far, the reaction to this report and money market funds, the preliminary returns on that are not very uh, encouraging. Um, and you, you know, I, I think the dynamics here, the Federal Reserve doesn't trust the SEC as a prudential or systemic risk regulator. I've, I've 
attended speeches where, you know, hot prominent people at the Fed basically said the financial crisis was to a significant degree the SEC's fault. Uh, the SEC likes its regulatory focus and its traditional relationship with asset managers and sees the, the, the Fed as potentially intruding on that. And uh, the FSOC is, is kind of stuck in the middle and the OFR not even being a regulator is, is even more stuck. Um, so wh what role does designate, I know I'm running a little long, but I'm, I'm getting right close to the end here. I, I think this, this question we have to answer is, is what role does designation play? And this, is, this has been a very economist heavy couple of presentations. But to me, this is a legal question, as much or maybe more than, than an economic question. Because the issue to me is, say that I've decided that such and such an activity, say something to do with securities lending, uh, is something that needs to be regulated wherever it occurs in the financial system. And then I, as, as a regulator, go and say, aha, you over there, this, this fund or this, this investment fund or whatever is doing this activity, and I'm going to, uh, to say that you have to reduce your leverage or somehow when you're performing this activity, and then they sue you because uh, you don't have um, the, uh, the sort of uh, prudential jurisdiction over, over them as an entity. I mean, what do you do then? You, you go search throughout the regulatory system and you, you go to the other regulator and you say, okay, well, you should regulate this activity the way I think that, that it should be regulated. And that regulator may or may not agree with you. And by the time you've hashed it out, you know, it's a couple of years later, potentially, and, uh, and who knows what's happened to that activity. Um, and there are legitimately, there are lots of ways to regulate the systemic risks associated with asset management. You can go all the way down to the security level, which you could do in securities lending, and think about the, um, the haircut attached to individual security. You could go security level, the fund level, the asset manager level, the subsidiary level, the subsidiary of the, the overall uh, entity that, that is the asset manager, or you could do it up at the asset manager level. And I think you need to know something about what you're doing and why you're doing it to figure out what's, what's best. Um, but I think there's, there's sort of a temptation to say, if we want to make sure under the American regulatory system that we have the legal jurisdiction to do what needs to be done, and if we want the Fed to be our lead systemic regulator, then maybe we have to do this sort of catch-all designation of big entities just to make sure that when push comes to shove, the Fed has the legal jurisdiction. I mean, if you look at the Federal Reserve plan to regulate short-term funding markets, which I think is going in exactly the right direction and is very important, uh, they talk about controlling haircuts at the security level, and they talk about capital add-ons for important players in securities lending markets. Does this require designation? And who does it require designation of? I asked the Fed this question, and they said, well, you know, tellingly, they, they didn't directly address it. They said, we think we have legal authority under uh, margin lending, under our, our old uh, Depression-era ability to regulate uh, margin when, uh, for securities purchases. So the Fed has the ability to say how much margin you can use in a securities purchase. Well, I can imagine the lawsuit there, you know, a repo isn't a purchase and you have no prudential authority over us, so how do you do this? Could the Fed pull this off just by regulating particular uh, utilities that are, that are central in the short-term funding markets? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. This is, this is sort of a, a question for lawyers as well. Um, so what's, what's so disturbing to me is that it seems very clear that asset management is linked to financial stability. It was linked in 2008, even if we get a good money market fund rule, there's plenty of capacity to sort of morph the sector so some of the same dangers uh, could arise, it seems to me, although I bet Brian will disagree. Um, but we, and we really need to cooperate and think hard about exactly how to do this. And so far, the situation here has looked more like a, a turf war, even though, as I think we saw in the initial panel, there's actually a lot of underlying disagreement, uh, sorry, a lot of underlying agreement about potential risks. Hello again. Uh, all right. No presentation, but I do have some thoughts about what the others have said so far. Uh, I don't want to get, um, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I do want to say and uh, comment uh, on what uh, Paul was saying. I do actually think 
that we need the authority to designate non-bank systemically financial important institutions. There, there can well be such. I think there are some. And if we don't have the ability to make that designation, then we're not going to have the authority to deal with some institutions that can have a big effect on, on uh, financial stability. So I don't have a problem with the idea of this or having the FSOC be the one to do it. I also think that asset managers are clearly important for our markets and therefore forced in financial stability. I don't happen to think it's likely that any of them at this point in their existence are truly systemically important financial institutions. I'd need more information than I have to be absolutely sure of that conclusion, but based on what I know and my intuition, it seems unlikely. I do, though, think, based on what I was saying about the sheer importance of this sector, it clearly needs to be better understood by FSOC, the OFR, and regulators, and it needs to be monitored. So I, I am glad that the, the OFR is doing a report, that the FSOC is looking at this. I think it would be a mistake if the fears of the industry came true and it turned out that this was just a prelude to designation by entity. Now, several points there. One is, I really haven't looked enough into the money market fund issue. I, like most of us here, I'm just going to put that to one side. Uh, that does look a lot more like banking than many other things. But putting that aside, I'll stick with what I said. In addition, it is possible, as Marcus was talking about, that changes in the things in what asset managers do over time, as a regulatory arbitrage pushes activities toward them, they could develop to where one or more of them did deserve to be designated as a SIFI. I just don't think we're there now, and, and it makes sense to keep watching. Uh, a big reason I don't think we're there now is something I was sort of foreshadowing in my question to Dick earlier. It, it seems to me that it's, while it's true that asset managers touch many things, that create systemic risk. And so when you do a catalog of everything that they're in any way associated with that could go wrong, it can look pretty scary. I think they actually create or amplify very few systemic risks. Not none. There's definitely some associated with the industry. I'd just be surprised if it crosses that the threshold at any given firm. Uh, and in most activities, I don't think it crosses the threshold. For example, again, as I was kind of foreshadowing with uh, Dick, uh, I was bothered a bit in the OFR report by the way in which there was emphasis on reach for yield and herding. To the extent it exists, I think it exists because we have financial markets and we have humans making decisions in those financial markets. Uh, and I know Marcus was, uh, was touching on those issues, too. He came to a little different conclusion than I do. But I don't see where, I mean, you could take, and this is an extreme way of putting it, but you could take a sort of Stalinist approach and say the stuff flows through the asset managers, and so they're the place where I can do something about it. But I'm a little leery of trying to regulate normal human market behavior in terms of basic decisions about what do I want to own and what don't I want to own, trying to regulate that by taking one class of financial players where the money flows through and gets pooled together and say, I'm going to keep them from doing these things in hopes that this will improve financial stability overall. It might even work in the short run, but I think what it will mostly do by putting limitations on the ability of asset managers to operate is it'll push the business towards people where there, where there aren't those restrictions, uh, who are likely to operate more in the shadows anyway and probably to the extent that they're contributing risk would contribute more risk. So same sort of thing with redemption risk. To the extent that redemption risk is just about people decide they don't want to own this thing anymore and it happens to be owned by them indirectly through the asset manager, again, I see that as a market-based risk, not one that's created or even in most cases amplified 
by the, asset, the existence of asset managers. I don't want to carry this too far, but there's even an argument on the leverage side. To the extent that the, that the buyers of these funds that have leverage wanted the leverage, there are other ways for them to achieve it. Uh, you might argue that, that individuals, less wealthy individuals in particular, might not have access to the ability to do that, so maybe you would somewhat reduce leverage by putting restrictions on it or at least watching it carefully. But much of it could be achieved anyway. Uh, another key point, and I think there's been a lot of emphasis on this, it's really important that we don't talk about asset managers as one large category. Uh, they're very different. There are many different subcategories. The types of risks that exist are very different in those subcategories. And I can see as a first cut why the OFR took the approach they did. But I think we should very quickly move towards looking at a more detailed analysis. So having said all that, I do think there are some legitimate areas of potential concern that we ought to be watching. One is leverage. I'm, I'm sort of of two minds about leverage, but certainly leverage significantly increases the, the possibility that a thing that goes wrong goes really wrong. And so we just, we just need to pay attention to where it exists and how it, how it influences the markets. I do have a concern, and I think it was a Paul maybe who was saying he thought the concern was overstated in the OFR report. I do have a concern about fire sales. The reason I have the concern about fire sales to the ex again, I want to separate out what would happen just because of normal human behavior from what might be added effect because of the existence of asset managers. But, but fire sales are a key mechanism that we saw in this last crisis by which the core financial system can be affected by, by more peripheral parts and where the larger economy can be impacted. Uh, I have concerns about exchange-traded funds. Now, this literally may be because I don't understand exchange-traded funds. Uh, I, I would need to look at this more, but nobody has yet shown me why I shouldn't be worried, and it is something I should learn more about. Because I think it's an example of what Marcus and some of the others uh, Dick were talking about with liquidity transformation. Now, liquidity transformation is not automatically a bad thing at all. In fact, on the whole, I think it's a good thing for society if properly done. But if you get a sort of hidden or false liquidity transformation, and, and it's something I worry may be happening with some of the ETFs, where people buy them thinking they've got hourly liquidity without, the, without capability of losing very much if they do pull out. And in a crisis, they may just not have that. That would be a concern to me. That may be, that may be more of an issue of how these things are sold and understood. But even if it's just that, it's important. Uh, securities lending clearly has systemic implications, and we need to look at the roles of the asset managers in that and understand that. Uh, and, of course, money markets, I'm just going to punt on again. Uh, I think the OFR, though, is taking the right approach in the sense of, of reading between the lines a little bit. I think they're kind of saying you might not want to designate any of, any of the asset managers as SIFIs. That may not be the right way to go. But you may want to do things about, about some of these activities that concern us, at the very least monitor them closely. If that's what they're actually thinking, and it's difficult to say, it's probably not that different from my view. I do think a number of these activities we need to understand better. Some of them, I think, there, there doubtless are ways that we can improve how they're regulated. Uh, but it doesn't seem likely that these things add up in individual institutions to create systemically important financial institutions. Thank you. So thanks to all of you. I thought that was an interesting, uh, really interesting discussion. And uh, uh, I thought we did have some lively disagreements, actually, uh, Marcus, uh, which, which uh, I'm pleased to see. <laughs> Makes my life more interesting in this, uh, in this discussion. I don't have particularly a horse in this uh, race, but I want to sort of see if we can um, bring out the issues uh, a little more clearly, a little more forcefully. Um, although you were pretty forceful, Paul, so there was no, uh, no need to press you in that direction. 
Now, what the report says, it was, you were pretty dismissive of the report. Go home and do it again was, I think, your summary conclusion. Now, what, what Dick said they were trying to do um, was identify some ways in which there could be uh, systemic risk in the asset management industry. Um, reaching for yield, hurting, redemptions, leverage, um, behavior within the firms, uh, risky behavior, uh, and the, also data gaps that they mentioned. And, and uh, that was something that, that Dick drew attention to, that you don't know uh, a lot about some of these assets or wh where they are, who, whose they are, and so on. Um, now, your criticism was, well, they should be focused on CIFI designation, but, but weren't they trying to identify some of these uh, risks and therefore give uh, the FSOC the tools it needed to decide whether a particular institution should be a CIFI or not? How much did it have in these, in these potential risks? Well, it did speak a lot to activities. Um, what it did not do was tie these activities to any particular firm. It spends a whole lot of time in the introduction detailing who the largest firms in the industry are and right. how many assets they have under, and it focuses a lot on separate accounts, which are not commingled accounts. They're accounts where you hire an asset right. manager to invest your money, and they're not subject to reporting because, well, they're not supposed to be. So, I mean, it, it tees all that up, and then it, then it, uh, it, it sort of tries to create lots of uh, concern about these generic risks that arise all kinds of places in financial markets. They're not just in investment, you know, it's, 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 um, it, it, did, it did not serve the purpose of linking the activities to any particular firm in any particular way. Now, if it had concluded that why well, we think these activities are perhaps where system, systemic risk would arise and here's what we need to link them to particular firms, which is missing, but it didn't, when I read it, it didn't really come across to me that way at all. It, um, it, 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 it wasn't directed in that direction, I don't think. Well, let, let me press you again a little bit in the sense that um, one of the things that's been, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about with, with Dodd-Frank, in Dodd-Frank and then post Dodd-Frank is, um, you know, we need to go beyond just the banks that are regulated regularly by the OCC or by the FDIC. Mm -hmm. um, we need to know something about shadow banking and where all this other stuff lies that could create risks or that maybe to some extent did create risks in the, in the crisis. So uh, you say, well, they describe these risks, but these risks are all over the place. But, but so what? They're trying to identify whether these risks exist in, in asset managers, aren't they? I mean, that was their task. There are many studies and other things that speak to money market mutual fund risks, to ETF risks. Uh, the report uh, actually cites some of these in the references, but it doesn't actually mention that these kind of things have already been covered. It, it sort of treats it as new ground, and these are financial firms and they have risks. Uh, these are some of, the, some of the risks that might arise. I, I did not find it a constructive framework to go forth and assess any particular firm as one that would, that would, ha that would have uh, the, the Dodd-Frank requirements to require a CIFI designation. Most of these activities are activities where conduct rules or other kinds of SEC rules. The FSOC could, could ask the SEC to, to strengthen rules on certain kinds of activities, but that's not a CIFI designation. And the report, uh, the way I read the preamble and the news, was that this report was done to help inform the FSOC how to make a CIFI designation in asset management industry. So uh, to that. me, that's why I send them back home. Do it again. <laughs> OK, Marcus, if you, I don't know if you want to comment specifically on that, on the CIFI designation. But you spent quite a bit of time talking about money market funds mm -hmm. uh, that clearly got into trouble in the crisis. And, and there was an exit. And you showed the chart with the, the excess, mostly I think the wholesale funds, the prime funds that, that, that got into trouble. Um, but I, my sense is from, from um, uh, the response, the other responses is that there's this sort of a, a line between money market funds, which yes, we had to have some new rules and we have had some new rules about money market funds versus asset managers that are handling people's retirements or rich people and, and, and their wealth. So you're kind of lumping those two together, and my sense is that, that the, 
the uh, criticism is that they're not, they're not the same. We've got new rules about money market funds, so why are you putting up stuff about money market funds when we're really talking about a different animal? Well, I, I would say a couple things. First of all, that the, the new rules don't really do the trick. I, I don't think that a floating NAV, particularly the floating NAV is, is somewhat limited under the SEC proposal, is necessarily going to prevent runs in these kinds of funds. I think historically the, uh, the stability of money market funds in, in normal times has frequently been maintained through uh, sponsor intervention. Uh, those sponsors are often um, uh, asset managers. You know, it's kind of complicated who within the whole loose network. You know, an asset manager, it's almost a, a, a brand name, and, and there's, there's an overarching, there's an ultimate parent entity, maybe, which used to be a, a, a phrase in antitrust, but then there's all these different subsidiaries uh, under it. But, but those, those sponsors have usually been somebody else in the, the asset manager family. And the third point that I was making is that this promise of short-term liquidity at a reasonably stable value, along with returns that beat the market, is just a super attractive promise. And if you, if you regulate money market funds and you take away a, a couple of the tools they use to make that promise uh, more tangible to people, I think there are other kinds of, of funds that are gonna come along and make similar uh, sorts of uh, promises to people. And they're gonna be vulnerable to some of this, the same dynamics. So uh, I don't think that this problem of liquidity and maturity transformation uh, and uh, wanting to sell, you know, wanting to sell this have your cake and eat it too promise goes away, certainly not based on the, uh, the SEC's proposed rule. Well, if we were hypothetically to separate money market funds from the rest of the asset management industry, mm -hmm. is there any evidence in this crisis or in previous crises, crises that the asset management industry itself, aside from money market funds, which are a bit of a funny animal, they were sort of an arbitrage, created in response to arbitrage, but right. is there any evidence that they caused uh, any problems in the crisis or oh. that, that they've caused problems in previous crises? Um, I mean, I thought Pete gave some, some pretty good examples. There, there is some literature uh, showing that uh, that the behavior of mutual funds, specifically that they they rapidly shifted their country weighting in response in response to the beginnings of the crisis, uh, did uh, really impact the international spread of the crisis, and that that's actually a tricky thing from the U.S. perspective because one of the things that happens when you have these global crises is people run to the U.S. You know, so it's it's a little bit the the international. Transmission is a, a complicated thing. It can actually stabilize uh, U.S. financial markets sometimes. But there, there, there's been uh, a lot of discussion, I think, in the Asian financial crisis about the ways that fund flows, you know, kind of serve as this channel for for hot money. And I, I think that an, another thing that wasn't discussed, we saw a lot of discussion from Brian of the equity funds in in the first uh, uh, panel. But you, you get, you know, the commodity boom of the last couple of years, which I think did play a role in, in 2008 through the oil bubble. Um, the, the commodity boom, I think, was related to asset managers figuring out how to turn commodities into uh, a, um, a tradable asset that they could sell as, as liquid and giving you reliable exposure to something that diversified you from the, the stock market. And funds are, you know, in part in the business of inventing these new forms of assets. We see it with the exchange traded funds. And as that happens, you know, uh, lots of stuff can, can occur. I, you know, I, I could go on, but. I would, I'd like to pick up on a point. Uh, you mentioned that funds can transfer risk and, and things like that. And in fact, the FSOC, I think, uh, when the European crisis first came on, was very instrumental in encouraging U.S. money market mutual funds and bank funds to get out of European mm -hmm. bank paper. So I don't know if it was the funds that, you know, ran from Europe or maybe it was a little bit of advice, but, mm -hmm. I, you know, there was a little endogeneity problem in, in how that went on because mm -hmm. I think if you read the FSOC reports and what was going on behind the scenes, they basically told them, yeah, get out of that, get out of that European no, bank paper. So, so is, do we chalk that one up to the asset managers hurting and funding or we chalk that up to the, to the supervisors? I, I don't know. I think you, in 2011 it definitely happened. In 2008, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. And the literature I was talking about was 08, but I take your point. Doug, can, I, uh, can you comment on some of these uh, uh, issues? 
Sure. I mean, let me step back and make a, a really, perhaps overly simplistic point, but I think it's worth making. Uh, you know, I, when I've talked about the life insurers and the ones that have been designated, uh, I suspect that was probably the right choice. Uh, but what I've said about the life insurers is it's clear to me they have significantly less systemic risk per dollar of assets. It's just some of them have a hell of a lot of dollars of assets. So when you multiply the two, they plausibly still cross the line. My, the, my point with the asset managers is I can see a number of ways in which, which they might create some systemic risk or, or the amount by which they amplify systemic risk could be noticeable. But I just think for every dollar of assets they own, it's a pretty small percentage. So I do think we ought to be looking at these activities to see if there are ways to regulate those so that what, wherever they're being done, they're being done more safely. It's just fairly implausible to me that the total amount at any one firm is enough to make them a SIFI. So I, I want to clarify something you picked up on. I, I'm not saying that asset management firms can't des, you know, generate systemic risk. I believe they probably could in, in many ways. Or that one couldn't uh, rise to the occasion that it should be a SIFI. What I'm saying is we don't have a framework yet that identifies that. Moreover, we don't have policies and procedures that are in place to understand what would happen if we did designate it as a SIFI and what it would fix. More capital. At the, at the management company top level. I don't know how that fixes any of these things below. So, so we don't have the framework yet. We're ahead of ourselves. And we don't, we, we, you know, we're not really even sure what systemic risk is and how to measure it. So when we cross the line, the line's pretty fuzzy still. And, and, and that's the part I'm reacting to. It's not that it couldn't yeah. be. We're not there yet. Can I, can I make a... Sure. Two, one is I think the OFR is like in, a, in an incredibly difficult verging on impossible position with, with respect to this. And I, I think they, first of all, that they deliberately did not set up a framework aimed at individual uh, asset managers because they, what, what I heard is they, they didn't want to get the report to get attacked as designating, you, you know, making an argument for designation of firms before they felt they had enough evidence to do it. But of course, damned if you do and damned if you don't, now they're getting attacked for for not being uh, specific enough, but the the OFR is actually not tasked really with coming up with that that framework, and I think would would get in some trouble if they they sort of went out there and set up the framework for what the, the tried to you know set up the framework for what the Fed is supposed to do uh, when they designate you know beyond the very general stuff that's in Dodd Frank. So th this is why I said there need there. There's really a requirement for very sort of close, detailed, behind-the-scenes cooperation between the regulators, and instead you have in front of the scenes you know, squabbles. I, I can't ever remember an, uh, an agency putting out for comment another agency's report. You know, that, that, was, uh, that was pretty striking. And, and just the last thing that I sort of have to say, because I represent an organization and we have positions, but I, I do believe it, is that I wasn't meaning to say that the designation authority. I, I just want to agree with, with Doug. The designation authority is really valuable. There's lots of things that entities out there do where they make guarantees, they make liabilities, that they, you know, they, they have liabilities that could be called on on a very short-term basis, uh, and they need some kind of reserve money to back that up. Insurance companies frequently do that, and they do that for uh, financial guaranteed pro guarantee products that are deeply correlated with the rest of the financial system and are quite similar to things that, that banks do. So I, I think it's, uh, it's important to have that ability for designation. Let me, uh, let me throw it open to the audience and see if we get some uh, questions. Yes, here on the end and then. Hi, Ed Groshans. I'm an analyst with Height Analytics. I guess a lot of this keeps coming back to securities lending and how do we find the demon in securities lending? And, and I guess when I look at securities lending, it seems like the actual institutions that are doing lending are the prime brokerage firms or the custodian. And when we peel back the onion on that, I mean, it's gonna wind up, we're gonna be back at the banks again. Like it's, it's not the asset manager that's physically lending out the securities, but those go into a custodial arrangement and there's agreement with the custodian whether they can lend out those assets or not. 
that really, if it's Fidelity managing the account for a pension fund, it's not Fidelity's decision to lend those out. It's the pension fund's decision, specifically in a separate account, to lend those out. And then it's the custodian bank that actually physically lends those out on behalf of that client. So I guess I, I'm kind of confused at where we're going with securities lending and how we're going to address that risk via the asset management industry or the vehicles there when it seems like it's really held outside and when you come down to it, it's JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, it's ba Bank of New York, Mellon, right, State Street. Those, those are where the issues are going to come in with securities lending. So, so your question specifically is? How do, we, how do we address systemic risk with securities lending via the asset managers when they're not really the driver of the decisions to lend out those assets? Well, I, I'm the one who made the big fuss about uh, securities lending, uh, or one, one of the ones. Um, I mean, I think that this, this is why you need, you, you know, this is as much a matter for, for lawyers as for economists. The issue is where the ultimate decision comes as to, you, you know, I mean, a lot of people use securities lending to juice their returns for their final, uh, for the, uh, the final investor. I'm, I'm sure asset managers are involved with that at, at some point. Uh, exactly who has the legal authority to make the final decision and also to uh, direct that in terms of selecting the counterparty and how that works. You know, I'm, I got to admit that I'm, I don't understand every detail of that, and I would bet that it varies you know, by fund and by the type of fund and maybe even by the type of contract. But it's, it's the kind of thing that we, we have to understand in setting up regulation of these activities because each, each and every time you can face some uh, situation because the way the U.S. regulatory system is set up as, as regulation of entities where you have an entity who has control over that activity who's going to make a legal claim that you don't have the authority to force it to, to, to do something. You know, so this is, it's, it's, it's very much uh, a legal question. And maybe, maybe I'm, we're going to find someone here who, who knows all the answers. But. Are you going to comment on securities lending or not? But I, I wouldn't hold myself out as an expert on securities lending, the minutia of it. I think there's some, some rules in Dodd-Frank that potentially put limits on uh, some of the bank holding company to engage in securities yeah. lending. They have to, yeah. they have to qual they, they're counted as counterparty credit risk, whereas yeah. um, in the asset management firm, if you're not designated yeah. as a SIFI, you would not be subject to those limits. So they're there might be lurking underneath somewhere some uh, competitive issue or level playing field issue. I'm not sure. But um, the, the rules probably don't apply equally to, to bank holding companies versus a fidelity. Or a, or, or a, but whether that causes systemic risk or a source of it, it hasn't been identified in the report. And, and I'm not aware that people are worried about that specifically. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dan Crowley with KNL Gates. <clears throat> Dodd Frank is a very comprehensive piece, piece of legislation. It revisited every financial services law from the 1864 National Bank Act through Sarbanes Oxley and addressed some really significant uh, risky issues uh, regulation of swaps, Title VII, a whole new regulatory regime, regulation of mortgage backed securities, and so forth and so on. And yet, the OFR Asset Manager Report was silent about the impact of any of these reforms on the marketplace. I don't know whether asset managers were the perpetrators of systemic risk or whether they're the victims of it, but it seems to me at this point, don't we need to assess the implications of all these reforms and whether at this point, uh, this attempt to impose bank-like regulation on non-banks might actually be a solution in search of a problem? Well, I, I, I agree with you. No one's really looking at the overall um, framework of, of Dodd-Frank and what all the separate pieces are doing fitting together. I don't know if any of you have a, have a comment on that. I mean, what, what, one comment I would make is that I actually take the OFR at its word that effectively what they were doing was creating a giant catalog of all the ways in which the asset management industry touches systemic risk. And if you view it that way rather than they were trying to lay out the case for SIFI designation, then it's a, it, it may be disappointing they weren't able to go farther, but it's at least a consistent first step. And you'd want to do that first step before you then said, oh, by the way, moving on from history to now, how are the new rules changing the way in which systemic risk might come out of these activities? 
And I, I agree completely with, uh, with Doug, by the way. I, I thought that this report got a bum rap from the people looking to it to be something that it wasn't. But I, I said actually in another presentation right here that Dodd-Frank took kind of a Chinese menu approach to financial reform. It's gonna take one from column A and B and one from every column and it's gonna do uh, a, a little bit on, on each of them. It, it really, uh, I think Dodd-Frank, even in Title VII, which is maybe the most comprehensive part, it still permits the over-the-counter derivatives market to, to continue. It, pushes the market in a direction it was already going in, in some cases. And we've seen a lot of these rules, you know, more than half the rules aren't even finished. So uh, the question of whether Dodd-Frank has really fully transformed the risks that uh, certainly it spoke to, there's words in Dodd-Frank that speak to everything that was involved. Uh, but w w whether it's, it's really succeeded in transforming these, these risks and controlling all these risks in different areas, to me, the answer to that would be no. So you, you still really have to ask some of these these tough questions. I'm going to I'm going to weigh yes, in on this too. Yes, and then we'll come to you. Um, I take issue with this on the OFR report. Um, if you're going to write a report that catalogs the ways in which certain activities may or may not cause systemic risk, you would want to explain both sides of both sides of the issue. Here's an activity, it's alleged that it could cause it, here's the mechanism, but there's other evidence that this same sort of activity has other effects that aren't externalities and don't need to be regulated. The OFR report is silent on any of these things that are positive and only emphasizes the negatives. That does not sound to me like a fair and balanced report that is trying to inform the FSOC and guide the FSOC through a process. It, it, it is very negative. It's very negative. And mutual fund flows cause asset prices to rise just as often as they, more often actually, if you look at the charts, than they cause them to fall. Why are we calling but, one but, thing a fire sale and the other thing not? Because you don't care about that part. No, we do. They, they, we they, want they, them to rise. You, I no, care no, very no, much. No, I want, no, the, I want no, the upside. No, no, the, the, the OFR and the FSOC are supposed to be looking at financial stability we issues. We can't outlaw losses in financial markets. You can't do it. I'm not Make them illegal then. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, as you well know from what I was saying earlier. But all I'm saying is I do think an emphasis on the, the systemic risks, that is what can go wrong when things really blow up, is appropriate for them. And in that, you're not very much worried about the fact that sometimes things will be pushed up, except to the extent you're thinking about, well, maybe they'll come back down later. In which case, that too would actually be a bad thing. Right, Bu thing. bubbles can. You know, we've built this financial system where we made liquidity. This is the importance of thinking about securities lending markets, I think. We made liquidity depend very, very directly on asset prices uh, in a way that uh, when we had a more, under the New Deal system, I think we had a more comprehensive set of backstops, uh, of liquidity backstops, and we also had... Uh, more entities, you know, more credit intermediation through entities instead of through the money markets. So, you know, like it or not, we've created this situation where our liquidity flows are dependent on, on asset prices. And this has created uh, this, frankly, this broader societal and government interest in, in asset prices. You may not like it, uh, but it's, it's the world we've, we've created for ourselves. And we saw that world growing in the 90s through the Greenspan put and through lo lots of other ways that the Federal Reserve was implicitly, you know, various kinds of interventions on international uh, financial crises, you know, where the, the Federal Reserve, the Committee to Save the World, where the Federal Reserve and Treasury were intervening behind asset prices. And we, we, we got to look Clearly, I'm not saying that this should lead to a particular regulation of asset management firms, but we gotta look clearly at what we've created here and how to, how to address it. And it's a world where asset price bubbles create a risk to the broader economy. And, and we still have the committee to save the world that's gonna regulate it after they're designated, <laughs> right? So. Uh, I think probably this is our last question and and uh, uh, we're because we're running out of time. Yeah, I'm going to really resist asking the question about whether it's simply a triumph of hope over experience that the Fed will save us from bubbles. Um, but my question is this. There seems to have been a constant theme in these panels. And Mr. Berner started with it by saying that so many people who commented on the report, it was just a big misunderstanding. Um, the the um, OFR, he actually commented, is not accustomed to putting its research out for public comment. Um, you observed that isn't it odd that the SEC put this report out 
And frankly, it's the only reason I believe that any of us knew what the report said. Um, I think that um, it might be, and I'd love your reaction, so put this as a question. Would it not be helpful to this whole process and instructive were the FSOC, including the OFR, to follow um, a path of far greater transparency and accountability uh, in their development of these extraordinarily important regulatory positions than has been the case to date or is as required by Dodd-Frank? Okay, let me start at, at the far end. Do you agree with that, uh, Doug, more transparency? I'd like to see more transparency there. It would be possible to make the hurdles so high that it would become very hard to actually operate. But directionally, I certainly agree with you. They've not been as transparent as I'd like them to be. I mean, the, the FSOC put their report out on the World Wide Web as soon as it was released. Anyone could read it and anyone could write them a letter, you know. So it's, it's not a formal notice and comment process, but I think when you, when you put out a report, I've never had a problem calling up Treasury and asking for a meeting, and I'm sure if I don't have a you problem... You seem to be complaining about the fact that the SEC put this out for comment. Well, right, because I, I think it was, it was somewhat of a hit job, frankly. I mean, it was an invitation to... Uh, to criticize it on the part of uh, the entities regulated by the SEC because the SEC didn't want to see the Fed, you know, stepping into its its turf on these these issues. But I think anybody could have written uh, a letter to the Treasury, asked for a meeting with the OFR. Um, you, you know, I, I don't think, uh, the, you know, to me it's transparent that they put it out publicly to they start did. with. The SEC did. No other agency put this report out for comment. Wait. Uh, the, the report was up on the web the moment that the OFR put it out, unlike other stuff that they do. I mean, I found it there. Are you saying that they somehow kept it, that the OFR kept the it secret? The SEC published the report for comment. It was not put out by any other FSOC regulatory agency. Uh, what, what I'm talking about is it was posted on the OFR website, and anybody who wanted to write a letter to Treasury about it or get a meeting with Treasury about it could do so. I mean, I'm not sure what the, the four comment adds, adds to that, really. But the, the other thing about it is that the, the, uh, the FSOC designation process includes many, many opportunities for the firms under, under consideration to weigh in on that process at, through, through multiple stages of the process. And actually, the public doesn't really have nearly the opportunity that the firms under consideration do. Uh, during the process. So I, I would kind of like to see the public having more of an opportunity during, during the process to weigh in. But I think the, the firms, when they, when they move toward a designation, I think there are many opportunities for the firm being considered to, uh, to weigh in and to sue afterwards, as we've seen with Prudential. Paul, do you need last comments here? Well, the, F, the FSOC designation cases are, are posted on the website, and they're interesting to read. Um, there's very little concrete uh, smoking gun to systemic risk. Systemic risk is a fairly, fairly hazy concept anyway, and, and few of these reports have any direct lines uh, in terms of many of these designations. They're very general. Uh, I think that pattern is what we'll see going forward, and it's disappointing that, um, that the framework isn't evolving in, in a more uh, exact scientific way and that the designation is linked to things that make sense for the new prudential standards. Right now that, that process has totally fallen apart uh, and, and, it, and it makes moving forward you know, that much more problematic, I think. Thank you very much to the panel and to the audience. I'm, I hope uh, this has encouraged discussion of this issue and uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>